Welcome back to Pace Immigration, paceimmigration.com, talking with immigration lawyer Michael O'Rourke. Michael, good to see you. Hi, Sean. How's it going? Very well, with some uh, some more good news for people that might be in dire straits. We're talking today about the Uniting for Ukraine program. This is a new program that's been announced out of the United States, and we wanted to talk about it. It's for people that are outside the United States and other criteria relating to Ukraine that wish to come to the United States. And I've got here the purpose uh, to discourage Ukrainians from presenting at U.S. land ports of entry without a valid visa or without pre-authorization to travel to the U.S. So, Michael, what does the Uniting for Ukraine Ukraine program do? Well, the Uniting for Ukraine program is a way to bring people who are outside of the United States, specifically Ukrainian passport holders and their immediate relatives, to come in and be paroled into the U.S. for a two-year period when they're allowed in, they're uh, able to apply for work authorization and for travel authorization, and it is a respite from uh, the war in Ukraine right now. Um, the not so quietly said second part is that they do not want people coming to U.S. ports of entry, especially the southern border, and applying for humanitarian parole. Um, uh, all three agencies, USCIS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and Department of State have all said that once this program is up and running, that uh, people who come without a pre-authorization under the Uniting for Ukraine program risk being turned away at the southern border. Right. It's kind of an interesting one, isn't it? Because we've talked about temporary protected status before. Uh, this is almost a mirror image of that in the sense that temporary protected status is for people that are already in the United States up to a certain date. Uh, this one is for people who are outside of the United States up to a certain date. Uh, who can, And the one big factor I should highlight at the very bottom here, people must have a supporter in the United States. So we'll get to who can be a sponsor. This supporter and sponsorship thing is kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is very broad, uh, much more so than we typically see with programs like this. So not only can U.S. citizens and U.S. nationals, which there is a slight difference, although for academic purposes only, um, U.S. citizens and nationals, LPRs, um, even those who have uh, work visas, student visas, as long as you're in some lawful status in the U.S., you're uh, permitted to be a sponsor. And this could even include asylees, refugees, uh, TPS holders, DACA recipients. So it is very broad. Uh, the, the requisition for being a sponsor, though, is that you must be in lawful status. Okay, and you're, you're always going on about status, aren't you? It's about status is status. important. Yeah. Is, status is important. <laughs> Uh, so then we've got who can be a sponsor, which is almost anyone, uh, but who can benefit from this? That is That has a specific criteria attached to it. Yes. So um, there doesn't have to be any sort of relationship between the sponsor and the sponsoree, which is great. Uh, but to be sponsored under this program, you have to be a Ukrainian citizen or their immediate family member. And that means a spouse or a child. It doesn't mean parents or aunts or uncles or second cousins twice removed. It's spouse or child. Uh, and then the tough part about this program, I think, is going to be that you have to prove that the Ukrainian was residing in Ukraine as of February 11th, 2022. Right. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you could have, say, a Ukrainian citizen living in France or was in France for like the last couple of years. And then now they're thinking, well, I don't want to go back there, so I will take advantage of this program. That's not the way this works. Exactly. And uh, I think it's going to have a lot of ramifications for people who sent their children out uh, or who might have gone out just weeks before the war started. Uh, because if they can't prove that they were, at least the parents were residing in Ukraine, then it's going to be difficult to take uh, advantage of this program. Okay, and we've got here at the bottom as well, they have to be Ukrainian so, and possess a valid Ukrainian passport. So if your paperwork isn't quite in order, it could be a problem. 
Yes, and it's difficult to get Ukrainian passports at the moment. Of course. Okay. So continuing on with who can benefit, because we also have here, believe it or not, you know, someone might be listening, going, but I'm not a Ukrainian citizen. Well, guess what? If you're not a Ukrainian citizen, there is still a chance of taking advantage of this program. Go into that a little bit. Yeah. So if you are married to a Ukrainian citizen, or if your Ukrainian parent has Ukrainian citizenship and the valid passport, uh, you could potentially qualify uh, to be a child, uh, you have to be, if you're under 18, you have to be traveling with your parents in this program. Uh, you can, however, be uh, a qualifying child of a Ukrainian citizen up until age 21. Uh, and uh, the spouse and the children do not necessarily have to have Ukrainian citizenship. Right. We've got an immediate, immediate family member here, spouse or common law partner of a Ukrainian citizen. Interesting one with that common law partner, because the United States isn't too enamored of the whole common law partner idea, but in this case, they are. Yeah, that that threw us for a loop when we looked at it, because common law doesn't really have a definition in U.S. federal law. Um, uh, only seven states recognize common law relationships. And when there is an issue about common law status, uh, courts in the U.S. tend to look to that state's law to define it. So we're not sure how this is going to be uh, handled in real life. Uh, it might be that as long as you can prove that you have been together in a loving, committed relationship with your spouse or common law partner for at least a year, then maybe that will be how it's how it's handled. But we just don't know yet. OK, so stay tuned for that. I've also got at the bottom here. There are some security considerations. Uh, is What is this fingerprint or biometric? What is this about? Yeah, they so um, it. In order to qualify for the program, you have to submit your biometrics, so fingerprints, photograph, uh, you're checked against international security databases to make sure that you're not a terrorist uh, or uh, fall on afoul of any of the other inadmissibility issues. Right, and we went over the common law definition that we have here, and again, that's a little bit up in the air, so consult Michael about that when you talk to him. Uh, let's move on. I wanted to highlight this. Very important because, and it almost seems kind of weird, but Ukrainians cannot apply directly to this program. It has to be done through someone else, correct? Yes, this is driven by the sponsor. Uh, and if there is no sponsor, uh, unfortunately, you can't apply directly. Okay. Uh, we'll go through some steps here then on what that sponsor can do. And the very first step you've got here is the sponsor has to file an I-134 de de declaration Excuse me, of financial support. Yes, and this declaration is quite extensive. Uh, it asks for the sponsor's uh, financial information, bank accounts, income, uh, assets. It also asks for the financial information of the um, Ukrainians being sponsored. Uh, interestingly, though, I just wanted to add yes. that there is with the announcement of this program, there's another big question mark because it doesn't tell us what criteria the government is going to use to actually review these sponsorship declarations. Uh, so uh, it might be what uh, they use for affidavits of support for um, a, a spousal sponsorship type case where you're bringing a spouse over to the U.S., which is income over 125 percent of the poverty level for a family of your size but it's a big question mark because we don't know what criteria they're using to evaluate this that's what i was going to ask i mean if somebody could say okay i want to be a sponsor but let's say they make somewhere in the ballpark of fifty thousand dollars a year or something is that enough and we just simply don't know it, we don't know uh, if we're using the affidavit of support guidelines, then it should be for a family up until about four or five people, maybe even six. Uh, but uh, again, it's a big question mark. And we don't know how much uh, the government is going to emphasize the sponsor's income and assets versus those of the people coming under the program. So again, this is uh, it's a TBD, to be determined, to see how it's actually going to play out. Okay, and we're, we're talking about families and specific individuals sponsoring people, but you've also heard 
uh, in the wind that nonprofit organizations might be able to sponsor as well. Yes, I have read that. I have not seen that in the program instructions that have been issued, but uh, I have seen that. So it, there might be a way for a nonprofit to do that as well. Okay, still all very fluid. Uh, we'll move on to step number two. Uh, once the, uh, I, I'm guessing that after the Declaration of Financial Support is accepted or found good uh, by the powers that be, they will then get in touch with the Ukrainian person themselves. Yes, they will email uh, the sponsored person and uh, be given instructions to set up a My USCIS account. If you've ever done this, this is probably the most difficult and frustrating part of the process <laughs> because right. USCIS does not make it easy to set up these My USCIS, USCIS accounts. Okay, and you've got uh, here upload biographic information, vaccine status, attestation regarding familial relationship for children under 18. How do they document that? Birth certificates mostly, uh, marriage certificates, birth certificates. Uh, if you don't have that for some reason, perhaps an affidavit will work, but uh, I would expect that they'll want to see birth certificates. Okay, and then after all that's done, they give you the travel authorization. Here's an interesting caveat. Don't apply for this or, don't, or tell your sponsor or whatever. If you are planning on sponsoring someone, be aware it's got to happen within three months, yes? Yes. 90 yeah. days. Otherwise, you go through the process all over again. Okay, so don't enter into this lightly. I mean, these are people's lives we're talking about. And if, if you want to sponsor someone, be aware that it's going to happen if you put it in motion and you have all your ducks in a row. Uh, so we've got here uh, what people get out of it. And of course, the big one is paroled into the U.S. for two years. But there are certain caveats with this. Yes. So, of course, the best thing that comes of this program is that they are able to come to the United States and try to set down roots at least for two years. Uh, they're paroled in uh, and parole is considered an admission for most purposes. Uh, you can then adjust status if, say, you uh, marry somebody or uh, it gives you options once you're in the United States to attain other statuses. But um, so you're paroled in for two years. Uh, you have to undergo a medical screening within 14 days, uh, mostly for uh, uh, communicable diseases such as tuberculosis. Uh, you can apply for work authorization. I don't know if there is going to be a special unit set up to expedite the issuances of uh, employment authorization documents because right now it's taking about eight months in a lot of cases. Uh, but hopefully uh, they will find a way to expedite this. Uh, importantly, though, too, when you apply for work authorization, you should also apply for travel authorization, which is also known as a travel document or advanced parole, because if you come into the U.S. under Uniting for Ukraine, if you leave, you are considered to have abandoned uh, the program. Your, your participation will be terminated, and then you have to do it all over again. Right. That's Is that slightly different from TPS? I can't remember. Where in TPS, could you leave, or do you, did you have to apply for advanced parole there as well? Exactly the same as TPS. You have to apply for advanced parole in order to leave the country. Okay. Uh, Uniting for Ukraine program. There's the nuts and bolts of it if you need help. Uh, contact Michael O'Rourke at moorourke at pacelawfirm.com. Michael, do you want to hear from Ukrainians about this? Do you want to hear from the potential sponsors? Uh, what's the angle of attack here? Oh, we're happy to hear from anybody. Uh, if you are Ukrainian and interested in this program, think about who might be able to sponsor you uh, because we have to have the sponsor on board before uh, we begin our uh, work on the case and begin filing this declaration of support. So um, I really will talk to anybody and give them as much information as they need, but uh, you have to have that sponsor in order to be able to take advantage of this program. All right. That's key. Michael, thanks for talking about this. We'll update people on it soon. Uh, all the best. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Sean. Take care. Bye-bye.